welcome to our final session of the day, which is about uh, after school. We've spoken a lot today about, uh, if you like, the school system on the uh, as we emerge from the crisis. But this evening we're going to be asking, uh, is the traditional university experience the future of education? And this is in collaboration with Santander. Um, to speak about this, we've got three actually really remarkable panelists. Um, we have uh, Matthias Rodriguez in Chiate. I hope you'll forgive my mangling your name. Um, the uh, I was actually just realizing I have no idea how to summarize your career, Matthias, because you're a former politician, you're a you're a leader of Santander's work with universities, you're a long-standing economist, you're a trade official. I mean, it's mind-boggling. I don't know how you've managed to fit it all in. Uh, we've also got uh, Andy Bird. Andy is the um, chief executive of uh, Pearson. Pearson is, if you've heard, is the most famous and largest, I think, education company really in the world. Um, it's the, uh, if you've ever dealt with NXL as a student or BTEX, or you've had a driving license in the UK, you've probably dealt with, uh, well, if you've done those, you've definitely dealt with, with Pearson. Um, also a very large uh, textbook publisher, but Pearson also has um, has innovated deeply in this area and, and has been very involved in, uh, in pathways uh, into higher education that aren't the traditional uh, ones. We've also got to that point, uh, Mary Kernett Cook. Mary is a um, former chief executive of UCAS, the, the British University Admissions System. Uh, UCAS is when people say they want to fix things in education, one of the things they often say is, why can't we have UCAS for X, where X is something that isn't universities, because UCAS is actually pretty well run and pretty sort of straightforward. And I think Mary should be probably pretty pleased that that's how people think about her. Um, the, 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 I was saying earlier, it's sort of a shame in Britain that we're not better at getting people into things that aren't universities. I, what I was really saying is why can't we have UCAS for everything that's not universities? Um, I think to start off with, actually, we'll, we'll start with um, Matisse. Uh, I think the, the, the thing I'm sort of hoping we can talk about in this, in this session is, is, to, is to really get to grips with this question of, of whether the three or four year traditional university is something that, um, that we should expect people to be doing in 50 years time. And I think one of the big questions in, in education is always about prestige. So can you convince parents that, that even if you can come up with a really good product, people will actually do it? Or do people really just want the old fashioned uh, stuff? So Matthias, I just wondering if I well, can get you to uh, start on that. Yes, sure, uh, Chris, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be able to participate in the very important uh, education summit they are conducting. Uh, in my view, uh, uh, things are going to change dramatically in the world of higher education and universities. I think the pandemic has uh, significant uh, a, a great change for universities. They have uh, adapted uh, quite well to the change. They have introduced uh, major reforms uh, because of uh, the conditions. They could they went to a blended uh, kind of uh, education, and partially uh, these changes are here to stay. That means not only in the format of education, but also in the contents, because we have witnessed uh, 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 along the years a dramatic change in the skills required by uh, society. Uh, mainly now digital skills and uh, uh, universities have not been traditionally well prepared to deliver on these new challenges. So they are adapting uh, uh, quite fast and in my view quite well to the new circumstances, but uh, I'm convinced that in the future we are going to see uh, education in a, in a new uh, uh, format, not just by, by the delivery of education, but the contents themselves. Uh, we are going to go to uh, microcredits, uh, kind of uh, kind of education with formats with require uh, less uh, time because I mean not just because uh, families and individuals are going to dedicate more and more time to education, but because the uh, need to adapt to new circumstances would uh, prepare uh, individuals and also universities to deliver. In, in totally new formats. I'm, uh, I'm totally convinced that we are uh, uh, answering to your question 
that we are going to witness uh, dramatic changes in the in the in the way the higher education is delivered. Right. Do you, and I mean, the thing is, so to, to be to cast a skeptical note, Matthias, I think people. It feels like people have been saying that for a long time, and the and the um, the traditional university degree, possibly because. You know, it's the degree that I have and it's the degree that you have and it's you know it's we understand it it has a sort of cultural value it really is striking that the traditional degree has really persevered despite the rise of alternative ways of learning isn't it well yes uh, of course I'm, uh, uh, you are totally right that in a, at the end of the day people want to have something that is prestigious but uh, uh, they have to realize that uh, it's not just prestige it's, it's usefulness which is very important. And now you see in countries that there is a, a, a level of mismatching between what universities are delivering and what society requires. So this is a, a, a kind of underemployment of uh, 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 people that have gone to, to universities that would eventually make universities change in the way they deliver uh, their contents and also the, how they adapt to the demands. So because I mean, in the case of Spain, that I know for sure uh, better than other cases, though through Santander universities, we have the experience of having connections with uh, 1,200 universities all over the world. But all I see in, the, in this uh, world, that the, you have in many countries, this uh, element of uh, uh, underemployment of uh, uh, people that are graduates from universities, and you, you have to react to this. And there are also a strong competition uh, by companies, uh, by uh, uh, other uh, ways, uh, the same that in other sectors, there are uh, new entrants with a new way to deliver, the universities are going to, to be faced with this challenge. But, but uh, I mean, of course, we are talking about uh, 20,000 uh, universities in excess of this figure all over the world. And there are, uh, for sure, uh, uh, most of them that are going to stay with mostly a traditional uh, model. but. I see a lot of sensitiveness across the diverse uh, universities in order to adapt to these new formats. And for me, pandemic, uh, the pandemic has been an enormous uh, uh, way to uh, induce these uh, uh, changes. I've seen in universities, for instance, one, I am the, the, the chair of the Carlos III University in, in, in Madrid. I have seen from inside the university the way they have adapted to the new circumstances and a lot of things they are doing are there for stay. For instance, courses for uh, 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 foreign students. I mean, in, instead of going to a traditional in, in, in presence uh, uh, course of nine months, let's say they are going to adapt to a new circumstance, maybe with three, four months is enough in order to be in presence and the rest uh, uh, going through a blended experience on online. So this is one example, there are uh, many others uh, that in, in, in which traditional universities are adapting, uh, let alone new entrants, uh, boot camps and all of these initiatives that are a, a, a total transformation of the traditional model. Thank you very much. Um, Andy, I wonder if we could come to you. Um, so, so, as I was saying, I mentioned before, Pearson has this enormous array of, of products. And actually, one of the things that's striking is that the so a, a term that no one uses in England anymore is the ordinary degree so if you most people in England have an honours degree and people have an honours degree to distinguish it from an ordinary degree which is a thing we don't give anymore um, the ordinary degree being what we would now call a foundation degree but actually Pearson still still does a lot of, of um, produce issues a lot of qualifications that are sort of in that space, right? They're not the three-year degree. So Matthias has talked about what I think the nerdily is called mode, like methods of learning, but actually the Pearson's done a lot of innovating around the type and level of the qualification. Yeah, uh, firstly, thanks very much for uh, the invitation to join all of you today. And um, uh, it's great to be on the panel. And I must start by agreeing wholeheartedly with what Matthias was just saying in terms of I think we're going to see a disruption in the education uh, field, similar to we've seen, you know, I come from a media background, um, you know, we saw the disruption in music, we saw the disruption more recently in video. 
um, the, the combination of um, greater access at greater speeds to uh, bandwidth um, and the innovation that's happening in technology um, is allowing us all to learn in different ways and that involves higher education and um, the old degree as it were and I think as Matthias was saying the pandemic has just really accelerated that shift uh, we're seeing it ourselves a lot um, and it's 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 doing a number of things firstly with we as a company have seen a, a huge adoption in virtual and hybrid learning um, to Matos's point and I think the, 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 some of the challenges are most acute we see them actually in the United States where you know you could be paying upwards of two hundred thousand dollars in four years of your life to achieve what is the question many students and parents are asking you know why be saddled with with so much debt and so not only is I guess the format changing um, but also the form changing of learning experiences and and as you mentioned we as a company are leaning into into those in in many ways because because at the heart of what our company is is the um, creation of intellectual property it used to take the form of a textbook now it can take many other forms many other forms of media and moving through the value chains as you say to assessment and qualifications and this the, the um, our assessments business and the accreditation and micro accreditation business is, is really growing at a pace you know somewhere in the world every two seconds someone is taking a Pearson certification to give you an idea of the, the size and scope and scale of, of this growth um, and I think um, you know you're now seeing to Matosis point as well a lot of new entrants coming into the market um, particularly corporations and I, I, I did a presentation in March and I, I, I referenced I, in many ways corporations are becoming the universities of the future um, out of necessity uh, the need to reskill and upskill their workforce has never been greater um, there are many um, corporations who will take students directly from high school and and you will learn as you earn I think that's a, a, a very interesting um, uh, change that it, that is happening and then you're getting um, you know to the what is the value of a degree question you've got um, companies such as Google and they are now offer you know their, their online certificates in, in courses around cloud and data management and AI and the thing uh, and subjects like that they are six months in duration they're fifteen hundred dollars and there's a whole host of um, fortune 100 companies who will now recognize that Google accreditation as uh, an equivalency to to gain employment and so we're seeing this this shift and what we're trying to do at Pearson is really react and reflect the change ultimately in in consumer behavior which i think has been um, accelerated due to the pandemic so can i ask so on your your thoughts about um how corporations are now crediting one of the things i think is sort of interesting about this is whether for example we're ever going to get disruption of the history degree right so i'm i'm really struck that so pearson runs you know a college in london like a sort of higher education college in london um and the from from memory, they think you do things like um, like visual effects and business and yes. that kind of stuff, and it's yes. it, it's on the sort of technical vocational end that it sort of it seems easier to enter. And if you like the traditional old like a, subjects that were taught at Oxford 150 years ago, those things don't seem to get disrupted in the same way. Yes, um, you're right. You're referencing Pearson College, uh, which we have, which we we, we do a number of. Um, um, uh, courses in data tech visual arts and um, we also of course own BTEC, um, which has seen a, a, a growing from strength to strength which is more about vocational learning and um, so I do think you know we, we were talking we've just actually created a workforce division to recognize this shift in what's happening in education 
and we were talking to some large healthcare providers. And one of the outcomes of the uh, pandemic is telehealth. Mm. Uh, this two screen experience um, where you look at the patient on one screen and you have all your digital tools on a second screen. And the healthcare companies are saying, we don't need more people trained in healthcare. We need to train all our healthcare employees in all these digital tools and skills. And so you're seeing this rapid shift that, that, that's evolving in those spaces. And then maybe to be slightly provocative in a, in a way as to the question around the Oxbridge, the traditional um, courses, technology is allowing the way that those learning experiences are delivered to change. So if I may use um, a, a music example, if you think of uh, a vinyl album having 12 tracks on it, uh, you only really interested in three or four of them that morphed into the cd where you were sort of still forced to buy the 12 tracks but you were still only interested in the three or four songs on the on, on that album that then morphed into itunes and mp3 and napster and that allowed you then that technology allowed you to own individual tracks and not have to purchase the cd that has then morphed into Spotify or Apple Music, where actually you, you don't need to own anything. What you do is you're paying for access to 40 million songs, um, and technology is allowing that to um, be enabled. So think of the textbook as an album with 12 chapters, and then start to think about how you can deconstruct the textbook. And also the textbook used to be delivered in printed format. So think about how you can deliver the same information through different media. And, you know, part of Pearson College, actually, we have a, we have a relationship with Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite. Um, and we do a lot of courses around the, um, the Unreal Engine, which is their gaming, um, sort of the heart of their gaming engines. We, we, we teach courses in that. But it's really interesting to think about more snackable versions, gamification aspects to learning, even in the more traditional subjects. Okay, thanks ever so much. Mary, I wonder if we could come to you on the, I mean, you are, you're a sort of um, an oracle on higher education more broadly, but your particular, the thing I think you're sort of best known for, Mary, is, is, um, um, is this association with UCAS, which is, if you like the traditional degree sluice from school to university. Um, do you think we can, um, I mean, what, what do you think about the, the prospects of there being another other entry exit routes rather from school? Oh, well, I'm a huge fan of innovation. Actually, Chris, I, um, I left school at 16 and went straight to Cambridge um, to study shorthand and typing actually. Um, and I didn't go to university until I was 41 when I jumped straight to a, a, a master's. And all through my career, and especially in the last sort of 30 years or so working in education, I've absolutely hated not being what I still think of as not being a proper graduate. You know, I really feel like I missed um, something important. Um, so I'm a huge fan of the traditional kind of three-year school leaver experience, partly because I feel I missed out on that. But at the same time, I also desperately want to see higher education uh, modernize and innovate. And, and that's why some of my non-exec roles at the moment are with innovators. So I'm on the, the governing body of the Open University. Um, I chair um, the highly innovative degree apprenticeship model at, at Dyson Institute, uh, one of the corporate um, providers that Andy was mentioning. And I'm also uh, a non-exec on another new provider called the London Interdisciplinary School, um, which has its first student intake this autumn. So I'm, so I'm very interested in what new forms of higher education um, need to, to be there, not only to kind of modernize the experience and what's available for students, but I, but I also think of it in, in a couple of different ways. So I think on the one hand, you've got the content, you know, your 
your traditional history degree versus, you know, learning music technology or something. Um, and then separately, the method of delivery, you know, do you go uh, in the UK, the residential model where you go to university for three or four years, live away from home, learn lots of uh, new skills as you emerge as a kind of a young adult, or <clears throat> perhaps as a, um, an adult worker, somebody who didn't go to university when they left school, um, using the opportunity to upskill or reskill and needing a kind of a much more flexible way of being able to do that because adults after all have have quite messy lives um you know they might move house they might have uh you know a, a new child in the family you know all sorts of things can change while you might be um pursuing some sort of higher education over a a relatively long period of time. So I'm actually in favor of both the traditional model, which by the way, I think does need some kind of modernizing around it, but also the huge potential of some of the things that Andy and, and Matthias were talking about that technology has, has made possible. Um, <clears throat> so that, you know, the prospect of kind of hop on, hop off modular study that fits in with these messy adult lives, I, I think is fantastic. But I also think that as well as kind of unbundling the traditional university degree, we've also got to think, think about how we how we how we rebundle them um, into you know into something um, that makes sense when you put it all you know people talk about stackable credentials and so on. Well, what what do they stack into? And I don't think it's it's not necessarily a good thing to think of a kind of a grab bag of credits, you know, that you take um, martini style anytime, any place, anywhere, um, you know, and to think of that being necessarily the equivalent of a, of a, a sort of continuous, immersive, interlinked study over a prolonged period of time. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the stackable credits thing, I think, has got huge potential for all sorts of different people, for different reasons, for, for individuals and for the economy and for society, but you've got to be able to put them together in a recognizable shape. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I have a member of my family who I won't shame, who I think has a degree in American studies, French literature and politics, um, okay. who, for, who sort of, you know, bundle things together. Do you, know the, is there a, do you think there's a risk of, of sort of, losing depth by allowing micro accretion or losing coherence or what's the sort of what's the sort of worry you've got well i think it depends on what uh what somebody's purpose is in taking a, you know a small chunk of learning you know maybe maybe they do just want that that small module that small qualification to to learn a particular skill that they need for their for their job or, or perhaps to get a promotion. But um, I think we've got to think of that differently to the triple degree, which is a, is a different format for a different purpose and has different sets of, of benefits um, depending on, on, what people, on what people want. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of innovation. Um, but I also think that, you know, that when we talk about micro-credential, digital badges, open badges, even nano-credentials, um, that, uh, you know, we've also got to bear in mind, you know, what value do they give to the people who pay for them? Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of buyer beware, isn't there? You know, they're not all going to be getting them from a reputable company like like Pearson, there's a proliferation of providers charging for these kind of things. And actually the consumer, the buyer, the learner needs to be very clear about whether these courses are quality assured, whether they're credit bearing against a, a recognized quality assurance framework and so on. So, you know, so I think there's a little bit of a danger that there'll be a kind of a wild west of uh, of qualifications of, of dubious value and don't forget and and Pearson is a, is you know a great example of this that 
uh, real brand value and currency for qualifications is built up over many years. You know, the, the A-level, people might know nothing about an A-level, but they kind of understand what it means and what it stands for. And similarly, more, um, that's more and more becoming the case with the things like BTECs, which have become so popular. And actually, people do understand what it means to have a university degree because that's what hundreds of thousands of people have been doing for, um, you know, for decades and, and indeed centuries. So I think we've got to be quite careful about how we think about higher education in these new formats to make sure that not only are we delivering um, useful learning that people can use for their purposes of upskilling, reskilling, promotion, whatever it is, but also that they have real currency. Right. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's um, current learning. So the, the, thank you, Mary. Uh, Matthias, I was wondering if we could come back to you. I think there's a, Mary has raised this sort of concern about, um, about quality assurance and about, I mean, the, the um, sort of informational problem with the proliferation of, of qualifications and potentially employers not knowing which ones are good and which ones are bad. And, People perhaps spending money on the wrong ones, but also so your part of your role at Santander is really about in, the interface with learners, right, and finance for students and and learning. And the I just wonder if you think there are if there are sort of um, practical things we need to worry about with this stuff too. So so are the are the financial processes in place to support students to take different sorts of learning that you know and and. Do we need to think about that stuff too? Uh, uh, sure, Chris. Uh, but I, I, let me uh, uh, first make a, a couple of uh, comments reacting to the very interesting uh, uh, comments being made uh, by both uh, Mary and, uh, and Andy. Uh, first of all, I think that we are seeing a, a, a very important trend in kind of the traditional uh, way that the traditional, uh, let's say, uh, universities are operating. Because now we see a trend of uh, uh, stronger cooperation on uh, universities. There is now a European uh, space for universities in which there are 40, uh, around 40 consortia uh, being created across Europe in order to cooperate, in order to allow students to make uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, studies across different geographies. In this way, we uh, facilitate the, the internalization of, uh, uh, of uh, education, which is a, a, a hugely important uh, trend. And I see uh, another trend that is also very interesting as we are all, uh, all of us struggling about how to deliver an education that is in demand in the market. And, uh, and the, uh, the demand is changing dramatically. Nobody is uh, able to anticipate what are the real demands in the in corporates, uh, Etc. in the next uh, 10 years, let's say. So we are seeing a trend in university going back to fundamental kind of uh, teaching in terms of uh, how to cooperate, uh, teamwork, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that for me are extremely interesting, but it's a kind of uh, going back to basics in order to be able to prepare people for whatever comes. Because this that we are teaching you is all is, is it going to be interesting whatever happens in the, in, the, in the future. So we give you, and this for me is going to be extremely valuable in the way that uh, I, I've been in a, in a corporate for many years and hiring, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of people, at the end of the day, you realize that is much more important, their capacity to operate in this flexible way with these capacities that maybe the technical things that they know that they maybe become uh, very, uh, uh, often obsolete in a short period of time. But going to your question, I mean, uh, because I, I, I wanted to make this comment because for me, it's been extremely interesting how universities have a moral across this. I mean, there is a, a problem, a huge problem with funding with, in education. Because every, see, every time you see a crisis happening in the financial crisis, now the pandemic, you see a remarkable thing that there is uh, less investment in education, in higher education, when the most important thing to address those crises are education. And, and, and why is so? Because I mean, uh, also, uh, I mean, from my experience in, in government, I always realize 
that in government, when you are in government, uh, you want short-term results. I mean, you don't want to invest in something that is going to deliver in 20 years time because you are not there. You have to fight for the next election. So everybody gives less important, even uh, importance to things that are extremely important. Important. So education is, is, is one example in which you have to invest to have results in 10, 15 years, but I mean, you have next election. So you prefer to, uh, to give more funding to increase the, the salaries of uh, public sector employees or the pensions or whatever things that uh, mean something in terms of the votes you are getting rather than investing in education that is all going to pay off in a time where you are no longer in politics, maybe when they think. See, this is a dramatic thing happening with education. So, I mean, you have less funding, then universities that are not public universities are private universities have also the challenge because there is, because of the pandemic, less international students. So they have universities in the middle of a huge financial challenge. On one side, they have more expense, they have to go through the digital transformation, but at the same time, they have a, a short uh, a squeeze in, in their funding because if they are government funded, there is this, this element I have discussed before, and it is a private uh, university, you have this challenge of less revenue because of foreign students, competition, uh, and all sorts of things. So, I mean, uh, uh, how to, uh, to face those challenges? Uh, I mean, it's extremely, extremely uh, difficult. I mean, there is, must be a trend in the, in, uh, I'm a part of a, a panel that UNESCO is working in the futures of education. And one of the ideas that we had to convey is that there is, must be a consensus across the board so that the countries dedicate a, a percentage, a minimum percentage of their either uh, GDP or government budget or whatever to higher education because it's the only way to incentivize across governments to give uh, uh, enough funding to education, which is key for the challenges of the future, be them uh, inequality or whatever. I mean, education is key, but we are not given uh, enough resources to education. Oh, thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, Andy, I was wondering if I could, I think we've got from, from, from Mary, we have this sort of her concern about how you, how accreditors establish the value of their qualifications. That's a sort of challenge. And that's one that, you know, Pearson's had to deal with a lot before. But also to, to Matthias's point about how you establish sort of soft skills, for want of a better term. Um, you know, how do you, how do you know if you're, how do you establish that a student has you know get up and go and all those other sort of soft skill stuff if you have a modularized flexible process can you can you retain those those features to a qualification i think you can and you um you need to adapt firstly i think um qualifications are are, are important and we've seen you know earlier events and clearly we we're involved with gcse's and a levels last year and we we're going to be involved in the self assessment that's taking place this year, and you know the worries. I think justifiable worries around grade inflation. You know assessments. You know I, I think are very necessary uh, because they 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 provide credibility. To Mary's point, they also level the playing field. So that I actually think it gives greater opportunity for for students to be measured on a whole and so to make sure not just that there is great inflation but that some people don't don't miss out um, and there is a, a a definite currency there um, i think um you know the the soft skills bit we have a, um, a a a large clinical and schools assessment business where we work with schools around the world in terms of assessing some of these learning needs soft skills as you could maybe say among students that, that that then can sit alongside the more formal education um and i just wanted to, to also pick up on, on something mary was saying around modular um degrees and seeing some of the stuff in the in the chat i couldn't agree more you know i have two sons and they both were fortunate to go to a wonderful school that you may or may not have heard of in at new york university at nyu called gallatin and if you get into the Gallatin School at NYU, you are assigned a academic advisor who comes from the business community, who helps you through your career at, at uh, NYU 
both academically, but also with an eye to life after college, after university. The other thing that I think is very interesting that they do, if you're accepted into Gallatin, you can take any course that the entire NYU offers, dependent on how you develop, because cause, cause what they, they posit, which I think is right, you know, if you're going into university at 18, how you view life at 20 or 21 is vastly different. So literally, you, 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 go, you go there and, and, and you can apply to any course that NYU offers within this construct, modular construct, as it were, of Gallatin. I'm sure there's many other examples, but I think that was, it's always struck me as a very interesting way um, to, to take the traditional form of learning forward. Thanks ever so much. Um, I think, I was wondering if we could go to Lucy Huberman, who's one of our, one of our, um, one of our members who's been making some interesting points in the in the chat and is a um, and is a uh, uh, an academic at Warwick I think um, the sorry I just uh, it's my fault for dropping this on my colleagues uh, <laughs> um, hi hi Lucy how do you see um, the so I, I just wondering if I could so you're a sort of um, you're a research-funded academic as the traditional university, albeit one that has historically been quite modern in terms of its marking, its modularization, all that sort of stuff. Um, how do you feel about this, this conversation about micro-credentialing, about um, uh, breaking up degrees, and uh, you know, this, this whole sort of idea of moving the, the traditional experience to something new? Well, I can't really speak... Oh. I can't speak for the whole university. I, I came in as a, I suppose, a professor of practice, although I'm a full professor from a career in industry. So I'm actually really, really interested in modular approaches and interdisciplinarity because I've got all my best learning in work through working things out on the job in interdisciplinary teams. Now, um, this harks back to your earlier conversation. What I have found is even though, say my own university, Warwick, has had modular courses from the beginning, I guess in the 60s and 70s, because it was catering for people at work, the departments that haven't really, they're still doing modular, but they're still teaching in the same way. So it's all crammed into a week or two weeks, which is really, really intense, 20 hours or 40 hours for teachers and for students, it's not the best way to learn. And we are sort of looking that, at that again. But for my part, I try to offer some um, elective modules for masters. I wanted a bit like Andy was saying, the NYU college experience to offer some masters modules that could be taken up by any master's student in the whole university. I tried this first 10 years ago and I wanted to do digital media literacy. It was the beginning of social media. I wanted to do citizenship and digital media literacy, and digital humanities. And they all thought it was fantastic, but they couldn't find a way of making it pay around the university. They couldn't work out the financial arrangements inside the university. There's no buying and selling. There's no sort of internal market. So now I'm gonna try again. It's actually 12 years ago. <laughs> I have no idea whether anything has changed but I do think the will is there amongst the teaching staff and some of the research staff. I probably haven't got time to talk about the research staff issues, but on the whole, if they want to teach, that's fine. But they're sort of told they have to like do it in their sort of spare time or start a whole new degree or something they're going to own and launch and take time up, which is fine. And Warwick is a very research intensive university. So each of them, each uni has its own priorities, but I don't think it's right to say that researchers don't want to teach. I think they're not encouraged or incentivized to teach and they have horrible targets to meet. I mean, a professor is really, I'm sorry, a cost center or a business, <laughs> you know, you're, I mean, to be cynical, my job is to raise research funding and train the next generation of researchers. I mean, I think what I'm taking from you, Lucy, is that the the capability of the existing fleet of institutions to reform and create these structures, it might be actually quite limited. 
I don't know enough about the, you know, I haven't really got into the depths of the management that's at that time, proper, but that's the proper as someone, academic way of saying as, it. As some, no, but as someone who's always <laughs> been interested in innovation, I am confounded by this sector that is the last to disaggregate and change and just passionate about building new buildings. I mean, I find it, I find it very, very strange. Thanks so much. I wonder if we could come to Akriyemi next. You've been, Akriyemi, you've mentioned in the in the chat you the the problems for people with special needs in in higher education. I mean, there, is there anything in particular that you think that that changing the way we do university, maybe breaking it up into smaller chunks, could help with that? To some extent, however, what I feel as a campaigner from London and who created the course SEN Law, I feel that the support for SEN isn't there in the uh, in in the kind of insight that I found out that when you uh, require equipment like an audio or laptop when it comes to uni, it's not um, you are required to put up a bill when, of course, the student may find that they become in debt at the end and they may not have that finance for the equipment that may support them within a lesson and of course I think that you need any much more funding I think that we have been sold with a lot of lip service throughout the years and I think of course it also capitalist that if we sort out our schools we are able to then have a better uni um, environment and for myself Yet to this day, I haven't received my disability living allowance. So I found that the support systems and the processes that's supposed to be in place are not in place and not there for the student of a special educational needs. Thank you ever so much. Uh, I mean, that's I mean, that feels like a, um, a I mean, Andy, I wonder if I could come to you about that, actually. I mean, the the do you think the I mean, I, I'm very struck that the. I always feel like prestige is the thing that no one wants to talk about and acknowledge in, in education. And actually to, to Akiyemi's point about accessibility, that the parents really want their kids to do a traditional thing that they've done. And that's a really hard thing to break off the, the tracks of. And that also puts in place barriers of the sort that Akiyemi's talking about in terms of if you're going to go away for three years and you're going to have a sort of three term, three semester year and all that sort of stuff. Those create barriers for certain kinds of people. I'm just wondering if you've, if if we could talk about accessibility and and you know what you found with that. Well, yeah, it's 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 a great point, and I think you know one of the the the, the sad experiences of many uh, with the pandemic is the great learning divide, the haves and the have-nots. Whether that's money, whether that's access to technology, bandwidth whatever it happens to be which has led to you know great issues around the world in terms of learning loss uh, which will take a long time to to recover um i do think there is an opportunity for us to really and certainly we're thinking about it as a company to think about access over ownership as more broadly as accessibility i've been struck in, in uh, maybe familiar to many of you in the fmcg world when the, the Unilevers of the world went into countries like India to try and sell their bottles of shampoo. They um, uh, didn't sell many or bars of soap. And they didn't sell many because a bottle of shampoo, if, if, a, if a, a customer bought a bottle of shampoo, they didn't have any money for food to put on the table because it was too much of their disposable income. So they came up with this sachet model where you get a sachet of shampoo, a sachet of soap, a sachet of toothpaste, much lower cost, much higher volume. Back to what I was saying before about how you could deconstruct the linear sort of textbook learning experience. Imagine what you could do in terms of accessibility and affordability with sachets of learning. And that then ties into micro, why micro -credential credentialing is very important, you know, and stackable degrees uh, and credentials, I think, are going to become increasingly important. It actually opens up the opportunity in society generally much more broadly. And I think that's very, very important to ultimately question, you know, there is a lot of parental pressure. You know, I would love my child to go to this university or that university and do this course or that course. What is the value of a degree? Why? Why? Why do you do that in the first place? And what would happen to society if you kind of shifted 
um, this model that has remained unchanged um, for, as Lucy was saying, for, for decades, if not centuries. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Yelena, I was wondering if you've been mentioning in the chat the pressure on students at the moment. I was wondering if you could if you could share that with me, share that with the room. Yeah, uh, so Megan Kenyon and I wrote a piece for Tortoise a few weeks ago called Crisis on Campus, where we basically reported on the fact that COVID has, um, rather than causing, it has merely exposed an existing crisis in mental health and wellbeing care on campuses. And speaking to students, as much as their testimonies were harrowing, and, and when you read, if you read the report, you, you'll, uh, I imagine, feel exactly the same. What was more frustrating coming out of it was that students weren't complaining about the situation. They want to be part of the university community. They want a genuine stake in decision-making. And they were giving, the frustrating thing about it is they were giving us uh, the things that they want to change. They were telling us what needs to change in order to make their situation better. They are not being listened to. And they are being, when they are put on panels or they are um, you know, included in decision-making processes, it's tokenistic. It's just lip service. They're not actually seeing their recommendations being implemented in university policies. So I suppose the thing I want to ask to the panel is how we can genuinely include decision, uh, students in the decision making process and hear from students all throughout today. I mean, I think the best person or one of the best people that we've heard from um, was earlier on in the day. I can't remember her name off the top of my head, unfortunately. Alia, of course, yeah. Um, she was fantastic. And, and we need to hear from more students. They need to define, they, they are defining, but they need to see their definitions of what they want from their education put into practice. Okay. Thanks ever so much, Yelena. Um, we're coming, we're into the last five minutes. So I'm actually going to basically set a challenge to our three experts. So I'm just wondering if you could, if I, if you, I could get each of you to tell me what you think the future of, of the future in 20 years time, what will be different about higher education that will alarm all of us? And maybe we could start with Mary. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, well, I, uh, you probably remember that I love data and the data is pointing to um, continuing high levels of demand for the kind of traditional three year residential degree in, in this country, at least. Um, and I think it'll quite take quite a lot to topple that, that growing demand over the next 10 or 20 years. What I do think is ludicrous is that people are, are going to university for three years, they're taking out their student loans and so on, and then as soon as they graduate, they're signing up for a boot camp uh, or you know, so, 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 some other course in kind of coding or digital skills. And I really think um, a, a, a bit, bit as Lucy was saying that I think universities do need to be able to incorporate um, some of these employability skills absolutely as part of the degree so that people can go on to, to study history of art or English literature or history as you mentioned earlier with, with, without a sort of guilty conscience that they're doing something that's worthless because they will get fantastic Cognitive, um, uh, cognitive skills and transferable skills from studying anything, but they do need some practical stuff to go with it. So I think the, you, the traditional degree does have to change, but I also have you know, huge hopes. I mean, the access point is so important. The Open University, by the way, has 25,000 students with reg uh, who, who've got uh, disabilities, you know, which is bigger than some whole universities are. And it really makes that point um, that we can do more for accessibility for people who have different, uh, different needs and different abilities. Thanks ever so much, Mary. Um, Andy, can I ask what, if you cast yourself, well, uh, other obviously than the Pearson share price will be at $150. The, um, can I ask what, you, what your prediction is sort of 20, 30 years away for, for higher ed in all its forms? Oh, I bit of not necessarily light-hearted but a bit of fun thought. TikTok is the largest university in the world. <laughs> and you think that's far-fetched. They've already started a learning division and they're using some of their technology to think about how you teach episodic lessons in 60 seconds or less. Or Peloton. Right. Or someone like that. 
Right. I mean, a disrupted I one market and then they come in from left field and totally disrupt and consumers go, you know what, that works for me. I mean, do you think the, again, it comes back to the, do, I mean, I, I have a, I have a history degree, so I have a sort of have skin in this particular game. But do you foresee those sorts of things disrupting the old, the most old fashioned, least labor market useful degrees like mine? Well, I, I do. And also, you know, you are still going to have the Oxbridges and the Ivy League schools uh, that are going to survive and thrive. It's like we're seeing in much of the world, I think, if you're caught in the middle and you don't have a plan, then you're in trouble. Right. Right. OK, thank you ever so much. And uh, Matthias, to this, the, what, what's your forward uh, projection for well, where... Uh, uh, Chris, I, I see uh, certainly an accelerated trend towards uh, disruption. We are going to witness a, a, a major disruption as we have seen in, in, in other sectors of the science, of the economy, etc. I, I mean, this will, the trends that are appearing today are going to accelerate a lot. I mean, both in the way we deliver education, digital transformation, in the new formats, in the cooperation among uh, universities, we are going to see a trend and, and the uh, COVID has accelerated uh, uh, hugely uh, this trend because in a, in a quite short period of time, a couple of years, we've seen definitely, I've, I've witnessed personally in some universities, this, uh, this uh, enormous uh, change. Uh, I, I think um, uh, lifelong learning, we have not talked about this, is going to be definitely extremely important. It's an opportunity for education in different formats to provide uh, 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 people with uh, 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 the access to these uh, educational changes and challenges. So, but definitely uh, we are going to see in the next uh, 20 years changes we have not seen in the, in the last couple of centuries. I have no doubt about it. Do you, can I ask if you think the student numbers at traditional universities doing traditional degrees will be higher or lower in 20 years? It will be totally different. I mean, we are not going to see. I mean, because I mean, now we are struggling and I've been an executive in Santander Bank for, for many years. And the way to select our, our, our people is changed enormously so, over time. So, yeah, I mean, too much the demands of a corporate or the demands of society in general with the, the way uh, that traditional universities are delivering, it's going to change, it's bound to change. I mean, we are going to ask uh, different questions. And uh, now uh, in Spain, we have a huge uh, underemployment in, in youth, 24%. I mean, there is a mismatch between uh, what the education we are providing and what are the demands in the, in the market. This is bound to change. We need uh, a, a, a fundamental change in all this uh, way uh, to operate. It's bound to happen. I'm sure it's going to happen. We are going in the right direction. I mean, I have to say in favor of the university that the university has see a, a, an enormous capacity to adapt to an absolutely uh, a, a chaos that uh, uh, occur as a result of, of COVID. I mean, they have to, to move uh, swiftly from a traditional model to a blended model, the kind of the evaluation system had to change enormously to provide a digital uh, uh, kind of help to the students. To uh, all these elements, they have operated and reacted in my in my in my view uh, very well. That says uh, very positive things about the capacities of universities to adapt to this new uh, environment. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much to, to our three experts, to, to everyone who contributed as well.